And a big welcome to everyone to the uh, third and final portion of our uh, of our webinar series on the John Deere air seeders. And today we're going to focus on the air distribution. Uh, again, feel free to post uh, your location in the chat. Just curious, it, it's, it's neat to see where everybody's uh, watching from today around the country or around the globe as far as that goes. Um, our main presenter today is Leah Laney. Leah's been with Exapta for eight years. Uh, she's currently our chief operations officer. Uh, Leah's family farm is located in north central Oklahoma, right on the Kansas line. And she knows how to run and operate uh, these air seeders. In fact, several of the pictures that we'll see in the presentation today came from her uh her brother and father's uh, family operation. And she's also one to pitch, uh, pitch in and help on that operation during crunch times at harvest with uh, double crop seeding and, and things like that. So she has spent many hours in the seat with the air seeder that we're gonna be uh, talking about today. So take it away, Leah. All right, well, thank you, Dale. And Thanks to all of you for joining us over your noon hour for our part three webinar covering air distribution on air drills. I trust you're joining us today with an open mind and willingness to improve your drills air distribution, as there are a lot of potential downfalls to explore. I hope you enjoy this ride and let's begin. Exacta has always focused on the soil engaging components of planter and grain drill openers and no-till seed beds as that has always been the weakest link. Now that we're getting a handle on some of those shortcomings, we can free up some gray matter in our minds to deal with uniformity of seed and fertilizer delivery in airstreams, i.e. the plus or minus variation from one row to the next of product when the distribution or dividing of the product flow is by splitting airstreams. This is much trickier than you might guess and the trouble is you cannot see a 20% difference in row to row variability of seed delivery. You have to measure it or count it or monitor it. This, this picture here is of a deer 1895. Note that the secondaries have a lot of sags that should be corrected for better product distribution and flow. The riser pipes should be raised, which is a simple matter of loosening some hose clamps and repositioning. Ideally, the antique flat top steel lid distribution heads would be updated for a less seed damage and more uniform product flow. So who masters air distribution? Australians seem to master this, perhaps because they use air drills for majority of their crops, or maybe because they've mostly used shank openers up until recently, so they have more time and energy to focus on product distribution between rows or maybe because Aussie farmers set up so many of their own seeding rigs that they come to question on how best to divide the product and the airstream coming from the cart. In any event, Australian farmers are very aware of the problems from poor methods, methods of dividing airstreams. Whereas farmers in the USA typically have never even thought about it. And exactly, we've neglected it too until recently. Farmers in Western Canada seem slightly more aware of the potential issues than their USA counterparts, perhaps because Western Canadian farms use air drills for nearly all their crops or because of education by some of the aftermarket companies in Western Canada who make air diffusers that can be tuned to each row, et cetera. Or perhaps because Western Canadians have simply used air seeders and air drills for more decades and are just more accustomed to dealing with their shortcomings. So what do we not want to do? In any case, it should be fairly obvious that we don't want significant variations in product rates from row to row. Not only is it a poor use of seed and fertilizer, but it can be hazardous to stand establishment if your fertilizer rates down the seed row are also varying and you're too close to the danger zone on the rate, perhaps because the soil is drier than usual or whatever it may be. It's very common for stock OEM air drills to set up the dealer to have one or plus, uh, plus or minus 20% variability row to row. 
but with some attention to detail, it is fairly easy and affordable to get this down to plus or minus 2% or less. What can be an even worse yield, Robert, than row-to-row -row variability is pulsing or clumping of seed in your airline. We don't want high humidity in our airlines, which will create product buildup, i.e. clumping, and we do not want to fail to monitor seed and fertilizer distribution when you're basically running blind. So what we do want is paying attention to detail. Achieve the plus or minus 2% or less variability from row to row. Keep dry air in the lines and plant with a peace of mind everything is flowing as it should. So what do we do about row to row variability? Okay, so you've made up your mind you wanna work on this. Good for you. If you want to do it right, it is best to first see where you're at by doing the bucket test. And by the way, the correct way to measure this is with buckets or pans under each opener to collect the product for weighing. Don't use socks or cloth bags as these will impede the airflow enough to skew the results. Simply do short bursts of seed or fertilizer into the airstream with the drill setting still. Weigh the product in the buckets carefully to find out how much variation is being created by the riser pipe, manifold, and secondary lines which will break down all three of these and why or how they cause variation in the following slides. Four designs create variability from row to row. Here are photos of poorly designed risers, manifolds, and incorrect secondary hose routing. Now let's address the downfalls of each of these. I'll explain why the designs are poor and provide alternative solutions for these problems. First, we'll address the riser pipes, also known as towers, if poorly designed, the riser pipe will create variability by overloading one side of the distribution head. This occurs if the riser pipe has an ordinary mandrel bin instead of an enlarged elbow. As the product comes around the bin, it tends to travel to the outside of the curve and then ricochets repeatedly back and forth inside the pipe until reaching the head. Offered by Exapta are the small air riser pipes. These are enlarged elbows that create a pressure drop, which helps disrupt the airflow and prevent ricochet. Even more important are the dimples or crimps in the riser pipe, which induce turbulence to smooth out or disperse the ricochet. Riser pipes without square dimples are a big no-no, and John Deere drills didn't have them until recently. These come in two options. We have the black powder coated and the stainless steel. Now we'll address the manifolds, also known as distribution or outlet heads, and I might go back and forth on calling them different names. The interior of the manifold shouldn't have any flat spots for seeds to bang into and for air to dam up. All internal surfaces should be contoured. Again, the deer air drills with flat top steel lid heads are notorious for having lots of flat spots inside. And this manifold design is still in use by some other OEMs. Another fault of this design is the J-bolt inside, which by itself can cause up to 2% seed cracking, not to mention the countless plugging problems from fertilizer accumulation around it. Inside the manifold, ideally, there is a cone in the center to help with dispersing the product to the various outlets by taking up the empty space to stop product from bouncing around in the head. And this is especially important on side hills. These small air outlet heads and cone caps are also offered by Exapta. Not the, note that the inside of the manifold is contoured, eliminating majority of flat spots for product or air to dam up. This uh, will improve overall accuracy. It will reduce your fan resistance, eliminate grain cracking and head bounce. This unique, this unique inverted cone also allows a more efficient airflow, resulting in less back pressure. And it improves accuracy by distributing grain and fertilizer more evenly in the head chamber. On secondary lines, restrictions in the secondary lines create further distribution problems since the air isn't escaping as readily from some lines as compared to others. The resulting back pressure further messes up the distribution in the manifold. The product will flow, uh, the product flows the air via the path of least resistance. 
Restrictions in secondaries can be from hose clamps partly crushing the plastic secondary line when it mates into the still feed tube or boot, for instance. Variability is also created by differences in the length of the secondary lines and also primary lines, since there's turbulence being created all along the length of the hose wall. Longer lines have more back pressure. The worst case is that the system has a lot of back pressure, usually a result of secondary hoses being too small. For instance, Case, New Holland, and John Deere use one inch secondaries, whereas most Australian air drill manufacturers use one and a quarter inch ID. That might not sound like much difference, but it's nearly double the air volume that can be pushed through that slightly larger diameter hose. Not only does back pressure create irregular product distribution, but the tractor hydraulics have to work a lot harder to push against this back pressure. It's the same as having an inefficient exhaust system on a race car. It's a significant drain on power. So just to explain these photos a bit for you, see how this, this hose, secondary hose routes way out here and then back around. Uh, that hose is really too long. It doesn't need to be that long. On this photo here, the secondary hose is running horizontal for a very long ways and it's a lot longer than the other secondaries that are closer to the tower. Now, we realize you have to have, you know, this long of a hose to reach uh, the outside opener, but ideally this razor tower would be raised a lot higher and you could even potentially uh, increase the length of some of these hoses that are closer to the tower just to try and keep uniformity of the length of all the secondary hoses that are connected to this one manifold. Um, now, with a taller tower uh, and having more vertical drop here, you might need to even use some zip ties to tie hoses to other hoses or whatnot just to keep them running vertical. And I'll show some photos here in the next few slides of that. Uh, these hoses back here are way too long. They come down and then travel uphill to, before they reach the opener. That's creating a lot of resistance. And again, the seeds or fertilizer will follow, the airstream will follow the path of least resistance. Another big source of variability in secondaries can be the trajectory. There should not be the slightest amount of droop nor anywhere that a given secondary is going the slightest bit uphill. Many air drills are improperly set up by the manufacturer or dealer and have secondaries that have droops or may even go slightly uphill immediately when coming out of the manifold. In many cases, this can be sorted out simply by unclamping the risers and repositioning them a bit higher and or doing some trimming of secondary hoses so that they're exactly the right length. Not enough to pull out of the, out of the manifold, but short enough to run reasonably straight. Sometimes a little wire or other support is needed. Or, or hoses are simply routed the wrong way around a frame, et cetera. So again, here's this photo on your right that blew up from the other photo. And you can see how, again, these are all too long. Uh, that riser needs to be um, raised and to where these hoses are running vertical. Um, here, it's very slight, but these hoses are actually running a bit uphill from the manifold. So raising this manifold, and or uh, shortening the length of the secondaries will get more of that vertical drop for you. Here is an Australian built air drill. Note how high the risers are and the steepness and straightness of the secondaries, all of which is very desirable for uniform flow to reach the row. Note that also the diffusers on each secondary just above the opener right here and the drill's owner is also running seed views in each head. But just see how, I mean, these, these towers are mounted very high and you have an extreme vertical drop. Here are more photos. Um, you can see here on, this, on these secondaries where they're using zip ties to keep the hoses running vertical. Again, risers mounted high with a vertical drop. Same over here, very vertical. So we'll address secondary diffusers. Another way to eliminate back pressure is to install secondary inline diffusers. These cut down on air velocity at the boot to reduce seed bounce. 
The first photo here on your left is Needham's inline diffusers, originally designed by Dutch. These are probably, probably the most trouble-free and they still do create some problems. One problem being that they have these deflector plates in them that isn't good for daikon seeds that like to split seeds like soybeans, peas, etc. You can get some without plates, but they still do the same thing. And another problem is eventually you can have issues with plugging when dew, dust, and dry fertilizer accumulate. And I, I probably don't have to explain how much time that will take on roughly 36 up to 96 rows. The two photos on the right here are air guard inline diffusers. Everybody is trying to figure out how to eliminate dead airspace by using spirals. We have quite a bit of experience with that as we used to carry the D-cup diffusers years ago, and those were a mess. The air guards here eliminate dead airspace where, de where the dew, dust, and dry fertilizer likes to accumulate. The spirals slow down the speed of seed and vent the air at the top. Most of the time, these are trouble-free, but we kind of have a love-hate relationship with secondary inline diffusers. Will they improve seed placement? Yes, but they all can be a pain in the butt. The main problem with the air guards is that you have to keep them as vertical as possible to make them work correctly, which can be a challenge. None of them do, do, do well with dirty crops. Like if you have oats, seed with sticks in them, et cetera, all of that just makes it worse. So instead of dealing with the inline diffusers, check out the seed views, also offered by Zapta. These are made by a company in Australia, again, named SeedView. These diffusers are designed to dump the air up at the top primary tower's manifold. If you have the secondary lines routed as vertical as possible, you can vent much of the air at the manifold and get rid of the air pressure. These are adjustable. There's a baffle inside adjusted with a knob on the outside so that much of the back pressure can be eliminated while still keeping some air going down the secondaries to help move product, which is especially useful if the secondaries are relatively horizontal. These install in less than a minute, which is really nice if you have any dew, dust, and dry fertilizer accumulation, just twist them off, put the stock lids back on, and keep running. Far less annoying and still do most of the work. Way less of a hassle and still vent majority of excess air to reduce seed bounce. Currently, we do not recommend for the larger five section drills. Uh, the secondary hoses are just way too long and horizontal. Due to how the five section wings fold, there is really no room to position tall towers to achieve the vertical drop on secondaries. Although we might have a possible solution uh, coming down the pipeline, here are adjustable risers. They work on an electric actuator to lower the heads before the wings fold. Our Aussie friends initial concern was how well the rubber section on the collapsible riser would wear with seed and fertilizer but it seems okay so far. Uh, they, now these have only been out for one year, um, but regardless, it wouldn't be a big deal to change the rubber if it did wear after a couple seasons. And this could potentially be the solution for the five section larger drills to improve on better hose routing and achieve more of a vertical drop of the secondary hoses. So call or email us on, a, on, on the use to inquire. This is still very new. So pricing and availability is yet to be determined. So how do we keep dry air in our lines? Exapta offers the small air heat exchanger. Now the main purpose of this heat exchanger is to prevent hydraulic oil from overheating caused by your air drill. Even if it's not overheating to the extent that it's shutting down your tractor, High temperatures break down hydraulic oil faster and shorten the life of pumps and fills. You really want it to stay below 180 degrees Fahrenheit and probably cooler yet. There are, prob there are plenty of farmer built hydraulic oil coolers out there. In Australia, just about everybody runs them, but you can go one step further. Instead of venting that air into the atmosphere, you can use it to warm and dry the air going through the air delivery system. This has the advantage of reducing moisture in the lines and helping to eliminate gunk buildup from fertilizer dust and seed treatment. For a robust heat exchanger that's designed specifically for this, again, check out the smaller unit. The universal remote mount version fits nearly any air cart, 
the radiator attaches to the frame using U-bolts, etc. And this is a do-it-yourself engineering, often quite simple, except for the John Deere 1910 carts. We have a special bracket stand that is ready to go. Uh, note that nearly all Australian air cart manufacturers, and there are dozens of them, use remote mount radiators rather than fan mount, which results in less stress on the fan housing while allowing larger, heavy, heavier duty radiators to be used. Uh, ours is 24 by 28 inches and extra thick, about nearly twice as big as some units on the market. These remote mount radiators use flexible ducting to mount the unit higher up in the fan uh, higher up in the air and it will draw cleaner air. It'll cut down on the dust and chaff clogging the heat radiator. Note that we don't keep very many of these in stock and it takes about eight weeks to get them in from Australia. So plan accordingly. Don't get sidelined in the heat or with gunk accumulation in your air delivery system, especially if you're running secondary diffusers and distribution heads. Uh, if you have dusty fertilizers or high humidity. And next, let's address when pulsing or clumping of seed along the length of the row is occurring. This can be an even worse yield robber than row to row variability. The main cause of this is trying to move too much product through lines that are too small. Solving the problem is a matter of upsizing the lines and or removing restrictions. And a temporary fix is just to simply drive slower. The primaries need to have at least double the airspeed of the secondaries. If that is not the case, then product will start piling up in the primaries, which restricts the lines and creates its own increase in airspeed. And then we'll pick up in the, it'll pick back up in the product again, creating a surge or, or pulsing of extra product being delivered to all the rows fed by that primary. The pulses may not arrive at each row simultaneously since some secondaries are longer and thus more delayed. This will create seed clumping in the rows of the field. A sure sign of inadequate airspeed in the primaries is if there's product that continues to dribble out after you raise the toolbar at the end of the pass. Also, ever notice three to four seeds piled up in the row and then a gap and then a clump of seeds again? You probably have surging or pulsing taking place. This is easily fixed by installing seed views, which will relieve the back pressure and free up the airspeed in the primary lines to keep them clear. So sometimes to prevent seed pulsing through the lines and clumping, the operator will compensate by increasing the fan speed, but this can make it even worse. Many air drills are operated with fan speeds that are much too high, which is actually decreasing the pressure of the airflow. This is due to the fan spinning so fast that the air can't get away from the fan due to high back pressure. This is called running install. And the only decent way to fix this is to redesign the system with the correct larger hose sizes or install bleed off units such as the seed views or small air relief units. So just to recap what Leah presented here, this section about the clumping is probably the most critical and important part uh, that these air seeders run into. And so what we're trying to achieve is find that sweet spot on fan speed. We want to keep it as low as we can, but still keep the product moving so that we don't plug a primary. And when we're trying to find that speed, if we go too low, we plug the primary. And if anyone's ever done that, and spent 30, 45 minutes or an hour cleaning out a primary line, you wanna make sure you don't uh, make that mistake again. So what's the common thing to do? And that's to crank up the airspeed uh, to make sure we, we don't ever plug. Well, if we go to the other extreme, the excess fan speed air pressure produces back pressure. And actually the same thing can happen with the back pressure will allow the material, the seed and fertilizer material to fall out of the airstream because it can't move. And when it does, it builds up in the bottom of the primary line. And as, it, as that product builds up, it can constricts the airflow, which actually increases the speed even more 
to the point that it will actually then scoop up, the airstream will actually scoop up the material, the seed and fertilizer, and that's your clump. And so, again, we're trying to find the sweet spot between fast enough that we don't plug it and not so fast that we cause it to stall. And uh, it's just a matter of trial and error to, to determine it, but we're going we're gonna to move on and, and, and cover a few more things that may help along the way. Yeah, thanks for that clarification, Bill. Um, so one method or a few methods to determine necessary fan speed, remove a secondary hose and aim it straight up in the air, drive at normal speed and delivering the, de the desired amount of product. If the product is flowing six feet up in the air, then fan speed is excessive. If the product is blowing less than 12 inches up into the air, then too little. About 18 to 24 inches is the ideal zone. So what's the ideal zone? Uh, by the time the airstream gets to the boot, it should be about 1300 FPM or less and ideally only about 400 with the assistance of diffusers and the secondaries just above the boot. Any more than that, and there's a higher chance of seed bounce, depending on seed tube and boot design and maintenance. This is where diffusers at the manifold, example seed views, and or in the secondaries are a considerable advantage. Also, the seed bounce flaps are highly important. See Exapta's Ninja flaps for John Deere 50 and 90 series no-till drills, designed with a 20 degree bend downward and made with a very durable and flexible material so the position of the tab will flex back to its original position. This 20, degree, this 20 degree bend eliminates the gap that all other flaps leave room for seed to still escape. And lastly, the long wear life is phenomenal. This is our number one seller of all our products. So monitoring our product, uh, be proactive here. Catch your drill problems while they're happening. If you've ever been side, or if you've ever been sickened to find out your drill wasn't seeding or fertilizing for part of each swath across the field or the entire season, you know firsthand why monitoring product flow is so very much important. So blockage and monitoring systems. On air drills, the OEM blockage and monitoring system uses optic sensors. These only assure you that something is flowing, not whether it's full flow or not. You are only alarmed once the blockage has already occurred, so there are no forewarnings. It only alarms you when zero product is flowing. So you do not have the peace of mind that both seed and fertilizer are fully flowing because factory sensors do not detect if seed or fertilizer stops flowing or the percentage drops. If you haven't heard of all the benefits of Intelligent Ag's blockage and monitoring system, you're in for a real treat here. Using a Q6 sensors, Intelligent Ag's wireless sensor system tells you the rate of each tower slash manifold is getting as a percentage of full flow. So you know right away if either fertilizer or seeds stop flowing or are flowing intermittently or at a partial rate. You can eliminate skips here. Have the peace of mind, all products are flowing fully and correctly. So how does Intelligent Ag work? First of all, say goodbye to the dust covered optical sensors. So as the seed leaves the manifold, it passes through these acoustic sensors. The seed impacts the stainless steel membrane, creating a small pulse of sound that will travel through an auditory tube, this tube here, that connects to the ECU board. These pulses are collected by the ECU board, which relates information wirelessly to the cab. Information arrives via Wi-Fi connection and gets, and gets displayed on an iPad. If there's a blockage or even a decrease in flow anywhere in the system, you will know immediately. And here is a, a screenshot of the iPad display. So here you can see each tower, these are your towers, and then here are your secondary lines. Um, so of course, if you have a complete blockage, these are gonna go red. Um, and, and you can set your, your margins to show the percentage of flow per tower um, for it to alarm you at whatever percentage you want, high or too low. Um, so if, if you have like a, 
a, a leaking or a, a cart lid that's not filled correctly or a, a bridge in the hopper or a meter roll that's getting plugged, uh, whatever lines those are feeding to, those, those primary towers are going to decrease in percentage. So you're going to know immediately. Um, this A, A, B up here, um, that is your mass flow, those numbers there. So A could be your seed and B might be your fertilizer. Um, if Again, if you have like a leaking cart lid or anything like that, or your fertilizer goes empty, your tank goes empty, some, for some reason it's not seeding, those numbers are going to drop dramatically and you're going to know instantly something is not right. Um, or if you have an increase on a tower, a, a percentage that this one's performing 12% more than the others, why is that occurring? Um, so it, it's just a great way that that truly monitors your product and it's not just a blockage system. So again, here it's it's more than just a blockage monitor. Um, we're showing here that if you have an open or leaking cart lid, uh, if you have product bridging in the bin or a meter roll buildup, a leaking primary hose, a leaking uh, or blocked manifold or blocked openers, you're gonna know instantly that something is not right. Um, with the OEM system, you're only gonna be, again, you're just, you're only gonna be notified if there's a blockage at the uh, secondary line because product's not flowing. So here's just a few testimonial stories. Um, this customer here, I'll just read it, but he it, it saved me this year when I had a fertilizer blockage issue. My old system wouldn't have told me there was a problem because I was still putting on seed. So you can see here, here's a meter roll that is starting to get blocked up. Um, you know, avoid these costly mistakes. Uh, discovering your drill wasn't seeding or fertilizing after you finished by either one, finding too much product left over in the tank or two, as it emerges or doesn't, is not a warm and fuzzy feeling. Uh, another, another story here, a customer installed Intelligent Ag Blockage and Flow System. He had two primaries that were performing 20 to 30% less than the other half of the drill, discovering there was a bridge in the seed hopper. Again, OEM system would not have detected this, so not unless he had stopped to check for seed or until the seed emerged or didn't emerge, would the blockage ever be discovered? So just you know, ask the question, how much time and money would he have wasted if he wasn't monitoring percentage of product flow? And if, if this has never happened to you, then you count yourself as one of the lucky ones. Um, it's probably just a matter of time um, before, before this happens. <laughs> Uh, here's a, a picture of the open or leaking cart lid, and I just I put this photo on here to to show you how easily it can happen. And this happened on on my personal farm, so it wasn't a good situation, and it cost us a, a lot of wasted time and and money. And just to follow up on on some of these things, it's been our observation with intelligent ag that there's usually two reasons that propel the the idea of looking into intelligent ag's system. One is some of the problems that Leah just mentioned. Uh, so even to the, to the extreme where uh, one customer, true story, planted an entire quarter section of wheat with the center section not putting on any fertilizer Yes, he did get the seed uh, in the ground, but he then got to look at a striped wheat field all winter long because the center section had no starter fertilizer on it. The other thing that is uh, propelling guys to look at intelligent ag is as these machines, as these air seeders get older, the OEM optic system on it has not only the issues that Leah alluded to, also the wiring harnesses on these uh, can get brittle uh, and start to crack and break, lose their consistency and contact and reading, as well as the systems themselves, the, the eyes can have issues. Uh, this is a really great way to upgrade your older air seeder to have a more efficient way of monitoring what you're doing and, uh, and, and keep you going. And along with that, 
with an air seeder, you will have a blockage sooner or later for some reason. Hopefully you have the intelligent ag system to alert you to it. But to find these blockages, uh, sometimes it's, uh, it will be in the hose itself. And so whether it's the primary or the secondary hose, the, what we offer from Exapta has these clear spirals in it to allow you to find that blockage much easier to clean it out and get going again. In addition to that, the hoses that we offer, the primary hoses are a polyurethane lined hose. And the key there is that the lining being polyurethane holds up to the abrasion. Otherwise, uh, the hose will wear from the inside out just from product uh, rubbing against, against the hoses. The second, the cheaper hoses will be a polyurethane blend on the primaries. Now our secondary hoses that go from the, from the towers down to the seed boots, those will be a urethane blend. And the reason being is they don't carry the volume of product that the primaries do because it's been uh, subdivided at the outlet head. But we do offer the clear spirals to be able to see those blockages if you were to have a blockage in, in either the primary or the secondary hoses. Back to you, Leah. Yeah, okay, thank you, Dale. Um, so that, that wraps up the air distribution webinar. Um, it, just reminders here, if you missed out on part one and part two webinars, those are on YouTube. Part one covered the mechanical rebuild overview for John Deere drills, and part two covered uh, with a Uniforce overview. So check those check those out on YouTube. Uh, really great, valuable information um, before we get into uh, our seeding season. Uh, No-till seeding explained DVD and seeding school videos. Uh, these are off. These are uh, provided to you with a purchase, um, but these are really great steps for. Our DVD is, has 10 steps for planners and 10 steps for drills for evaluating and adjusting um, these in the field. Um, and then seeding schools, we have uh, 2016, 18, and 19 with guest speakers. Uh, those are really great as well. And then our newsletters online. Um, we have a ton of these on there, and even though they're dated back quite a ways, uh, there still can be applied to, to today's uh, struggles and problems that we all face when it comes to seeding. Uh, follow us on social media. We would love to connect with you. We're on YouTube um, with lots of past webinars, how-to videos, um, install videos, you name it. And Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, again, we would just go follow us. We'd love to connect with you. And Lastly, we like hearing from you. Um, if you have questions about anything, problems you're experiencing, we might have a solution for you or experience that we can share. Um, if, if we don't, we'll typically know somebody that does. So um, yeah, reach out to us, email us, give us a call. And now we'll get into any of the questions that people might have that we'll try to answer. Yeah, uh, Leah, just, just to follow up again, this, this session will be available to, for review on, on YouTube uh, probably uh, tomorrow, as soon as tomorrow. Uh, but getting into our Q&A session, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take one here. One of the early questions came from Bryce is uh, asking if the secondary hoses should be the same length and how do we avoid droops in the 90 series drills? To avoid the droops, the best way is to elevate the riser pipe and the outlet heads. Uh, that, that was another reason why we were showing the examples of the Australian cedars, how they elevate their riser pipes or their outlet heads much, much higher than what we do here in North America or what John Deere offers. Once we get those elevated then we can eliminate the droop going to the the secondary uh, down the secondary line to the boot yeah and and that also um with raising your towers you can shorten up some of the lengths of those hoses um or again if you have to have it be a certain length 
you can um, you know zip tie it to some other hoses to keep that vertical drop. Um, I'll take the next one. How do we upgrade to one and a quarter inch secondary lines on a John Deere 1890? All fittings are sized for one inch lines, including the Intelligent Ag System. Um, first of all, Intelligent Ag System does come, they do offer one and a quarter inch uh, sensors. And you can upgrade by simply getting one and a quarter inch lines. And on your manifolds, uh, you might have to change the manifolds which we can get those as well um, to, you're, you're might gonna have to make some different changes um, across the board, but manifolds you can get to accompany the uh, one and a quarter inch hoses. So that, that can easily be done and it, we might have to do some custom designing for you as well, but we can help with that. The challenge with that one is, uh, yes, we can do the, the customizing that, that Lee is talking about. The challenge then is is uh, getting to the seed boot. It's still going to be John Deere seed boot or someone's equivalent to it that's made up for a, a one-inch hose. So at the very end, it's still going to have to reduce down to a one-inch hose until someone comes up with an aftermarket seed boot that'll accept an inch and a quarter line. Uh, next question uh, from Wayne, it says, uh, what is the appropriate st uh, stall speed of the fan? Th that one's a challenge. It's because there's variables involved. The fan speed is gonna be different on a 30 foot three section drill versus a 42 foot versus a 60 foot. Uh, so it's hard, it's, it's, we can't give just a, a, a set number, a set RPM. It's going to be trial and error to the machine to find that spot that works for you. And also how much product we're moving is it makes a huge difference. If we're only uh, um, seeding a, a grain sorghum in, in, in Kansas or Oklahoma at, at five pounds to the acre versus um, 100 pounds of seed wheat, that in itself takes totally different fan speed. So if you block one rank for seeding, does it help uniformity to rearrange secondaries evenly around tower? Well, first of all, it would help uniform, uniformity in general, whether you are blocking one rank or not, to rearrange secondaries evenly around the tower. Um, you know, you would want to do that from the get-go. Um, if you are blocking one rank for seeding, that it could be because you have a couple lines or that one particular line with too long of a secondary hose, maybe running too horizontal. Um, there could be some issues at the seed boot that is causing, disrupting some of the airflow that's causing that boot to block up. Yeah, good, good point, Leah. Um, next one from Darren, any experience with a spiral roll meter sections versus a John Deere roller sections and honestly I, I don't have any experience with the spiral runs yeah and i do not either okay uh looks like luke um, was just offer, offering up that he was able to cut off uh the 32 millimeter hose and then slide the then slide a hose class at the seed boot. Okay, so he basically made a, a, a reducer. Yeah, so you'd cut the top of the seed boot off and then slide the hose over that seed boot. I've seen that done. Some photos from Australia. Yes, and then we've also got a question from Jason about the advice for a 1990 CCS drill uh, that does not have towers. Uh, can intelligent egg system be used on the 1990s? Yes, intelligent egg systems will work with the CCS drills. Uh, 
the CCS drills do have a few different challenges or, or they're, they're different in how they divide their seed and how they deliver it to the boot. Uh, there are no manifolds. It's more of a dividing system. Um, and so they have, uh, they generally are able to operate with lower fan speeds as well. And that's maybe something we need to look at is doing a session just on CCS drills because they are different compared to the car drills. Okay, any more questions? Okay, I'm looking over on the chat side. There may be some questions there. Looks like we're pretty well caught up. There's just some information being shared on there about the 1895 and that one of the, uh, with the fertilizer placement, okay. Yeah, we'll have to look into the spiral meter rolls. And that is something, see, if you are running a lot of fertilizer, um, seed views will, will throw the fertilizer dust and, and coat your drill. So that is one downside, that's for sure. All right. Well, um, or the last last thing, um, instead of cutting off the modifying your existing seed tubes, um, if you were wanting to upgrade to the one and a quarter inch, um, you could get a stainless steel pipe um, and put that into the seed boot and then use your uh, one and a quarter inch hose to slide over the top. Um, and that was shared by Darren Peters. So stainless steel would be nice as well. So, okay, well, that looks like all the questions we've received so far. So we'll wrap it up. This will be posted to YouTube um, probably by tomorrow. So thank you for joining us. And if you think of any questions down the road, you can call us or email us and we'd be loved to, we would love to help you out in any way we can. Thank you everybody for tuning in today. Be watching for more.